Hi everyone, welcome back to video three. In this video, we're gonna be going over uh, the PowerPoint found in the weekly learning week one folder. We're gonna talk about what we're gonna cover in this course uh, from a broad perspective, and then what we're gonna spend a bit of time uh, doing is UML for the first part and talking about the inception phase and the system development life cycle and assignment one. So we're gonna cover all of that in this video. Um, and going over the PowerPoint, you can follow along, download the PowerPoint from Blackboard, um, or just watch on this video. So uh, going through the PowerPoint here, here's a bit about me. If you want to read, I know I already introduced myself in the other video, and uh, the course information and syllabus can be found on Blackboard right there. What you're going to get out of this course is right here with the learning outcomes there. We already covered that in the other video, but if you want to pause it quickly so you can refresh your uh, refresh yourselves, uh, then pause your video right here and read those. The course content, what's going to be covered here, um, domain name registration, web hosting, content management systems, publishing to the Google Play Store, um, as well as the Apple Play Store if we have time, and then supporting your apps after they're published. Okay, and then all that other stuff underneath that line are things that we can try to get to if we have time in the year. So revenue models, advertiser integrations, application analytics, in-app purchases, content rating, and release management. If we don't cover them now, in this semester, we'll cover them next semester. Cool. So the grading structure we already talked about, we're going to cover assignment one today. I'll have an, a, a separate video for assignment one uh, so that you can just focus on that right there. And then the rest of the assignments we'll talk about in advance as we go through the semester. Cool. So late submissions. Um, I want everything submitted by 11.59 on their due dates. Otherwise, 20% per day does apply unless you give me, uh, you know, a couple days notice then I can be lenient with you cool and then uh, we already covered this as well we covered this let's get into it so what is the system development life cycle system development system and system development life cycle or the SDLC is basically a process in software development um, and we have five stages or generally agreed upon five stages in the industry for uh, part of that SDLC so you can kind of see here there's more than five in this picture. Um, they're kind of separated into more than the basic five. But in this next slide here, um, we have the five steps that I like to refer to. So um, the first step is your analyze or your research phase where you come up with that idea and you uh, kind of brainstorm what am I going to create. So for creating a business or creating an app for our portfolio, um, which is kind of the whole idea of this course. We're going to create something that we can brag about and use uh, to make employers want us and want to hire us as potential developers, right? So we want to kind of showboat our skill and we want to come up with a really cool idea um, and a brand for ourselves. So that's really what this is all about, is creating that brand and that portfolio about who you are as a developer, who you are as a person, your hobbies, your interests, but also like, are you going to fit in to their company? Are you going to fit into their culture? Are you going to fit into their criteria for development uh, or a developer? So that first phase is going to be researching those ideas and it's going to be coming up with and brainstorming and shooting down the bad ideas and really coming to one final idea that you're like, yeah, this is what we can work with. And this is going to be what we can work with this semester for these next four months. So that's where we're going to use UML, use cases, technology and strategy to research all those things. You're going to get a competitive advantage um, and what makes you different than your competitors. Cool. Um, so step two is the design phase. And that's where you move forward from that planning phase to the actual let's start working on this. So you've got the idea, you've got everything kind of wireframed out, so to say, and now you're going to actually start making the UI and, and the wireframing and the prototyping and the proof of concepts. After the design is when you actually start building it. So you've maybe designed the logos and you've designed the icons and the, the app packages and maybe the screenshots for the Play Store upload, but you haven't actually made the app. You just have all the uh, prototypes ready. So, you know, at this stage, the design stage, if you are on a, a big uh, scale, you would pitch that to someone and you'd get funding. So you have everything prototyped and then it's like, okay, pay me or help fund me and you can own part of this company and then I'm going to develop it. Um, so that's what stage three is, is developing. Um, you're going to be basically programming and building 
the application. So if there's network um, or different platforms that are needed, um, you know, if it's a web browser uh, or if it's used on a web browser, uh, performance and usability, security, all of that good stuff. Um, <clears throat> the fourth step, this one says certify. Um, I usually, yeah, like to say like it's it's actually uploading it or it's actually deploying is what I like to say. Um, I know it says deploy in the fifth step there. The fifth step I kind of have separated to be its own like um, support. So you'll see this is just a, a basic and they they kind of have the stages there. But um, yeah, the fourth step is deploying it to that app store, getting the certification and the approval, you know, so you are certified and you have it now online and it's out there to the public or, you know, you get beta testers, alpha testers. And then the, the final stage is now that it's out there, now that people are using it and downloading it is supporting it and, um, you know, going through this whole thing again. So like kind of looping through it and going back to the beginning, being like, what do I need to fix? What do I need to redesign? What do I need to redevelop? What bugs are there? Um, what stuff are my users telling me? They want new features, um, new fixes, etc. And then just maintaining updates for your application and continuing that whole cycle. Okay, so that's kind of like a, a really rough overview. And here's some slides covering basically uh, uh, a, a basic description of each phase. So the first one is inception. <clears throat> and I like to refer as much as possible to real world examples when I can. So um, for me, when we did this in our scrum team uh, at the company I worked with in Toronto, um, we knew what the product was going to be. We, we didn't have to come up with something brand new because the client approached us and they said, we want this merchandise financial program. Uh, so we want to be able to count how many items are being moved from a store and like all these different locations. And we want to be able to see it. And we want to be able to visualize it. We want to generate reports and have a data cube. Um, so we didn't have to really come up with the inception, but if you're going to be your own business, your own company, then the inception phase is really important to get all of those details out of the way. The design phase is really where you get to have fun as a, a developer um, and, you know, picking the tools that you're going to use. Um, you can even do that a bit in the inception phase. You know, like for us, we had to come up with something that would work on the web as well as be really scalable. So we chose, um, a SQL database and we chose a stack that we worked with before. So you pick your programming stack, right? So we picked um, Microsoft SQL Server because we had the licenses for it already and um, it's really secure and Microsoft supports it and it's not just a free version. So it's it's going to be uh, really well thought out. Um, then we had React and we did uh, that for the front end and we made sure that with everything in between there for our whole technology stack, we chose languages that integrated well with each other and were languages that everyone on the team was strong with. So the design phase isn't only necessarily picking that, but it's also um, you know, generating those design ideas and those mockups and kind of fleshing them out a little bit more like I already talked about. Cool, the development phase, this is the most intensive one and probably the longest one. You're gonna kind of have to loop back and go back to the ideas and the, the design every now and then, so that's totally okay. Stabilization phase, so this can kind of be swapped out with a de the deployment phase. You can do deploying, deploying first and then stabilizing it where you're like supporting it and putting out new updates or you can do the stabilization first. It depends what you wanna do. If you wanna get it out there in the world and then have beta testers and then get all the bug fixes out of the way, and then you have a full release, then that's totally cool. Or you can do uh, stabilization first and have everything go through QA. And uh, we actually had this in, in our project uh, in Toronto where we had a QA team and we would send it to them and they would go through the code and they would test every scenario. And they weren't on the development team, they were just part of quality assurance. And they would just make sure everything worked the way it was and they would find bugs and come back to us until we kept fixing them. And we, maybe we would fix a bug and then it created a different bug. And then they would be like, hey, you got to fix this again until everything was perfect. And then we went to the client and then we were like, okay, this is ready for you guys. Cool. And then the final phase, which is the deployment phase. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Yes, the deployment phase, which is the final stage. Um, as your app's ready to be launched, it's now time for you to register it over the app store. So that's just deploying it online so it's ready. 
So what we're gonna focus on for the first little while here is the inception phase. So each of those phases, you'll notice there's five and there's five assignments for the course. So it's kind of put together in a way where each phase has its own assignment. So assignment one, the inception uh, phase will basically be coming up with that idea for your portfolio. What's your brand? Who are you as a person? What do you wanna be known for as a developer? What are you going to create in your portfolio that some employer down the road is gonna look at you and be like, I want to hire this person, not this person. Because look at the work that they have, look at how well done it is, and this complete portfolio package they've developed of all their mobile applications is really well thought out. And I like that, and I'm gonna hire that. So the inception phase is gonna be about defining and refining the idea for an app that we're gonna make in this course. Each person's gonna make an app, okay? And it's important to ask some really fundamental questions here uh, before we actually get into the development, before we get into the publishing, planning is key, all right? You may have heard that famous quote, failing to plan, or planning, yeah, failing to plan is planning to fail, right? So if you don't plan, uh, then you're just gonna have a disaster on your hands. You're not gonna know which way or what direction you wanna go with your app, and you're not gonna have uh, basically a smooth process and that's why the STLC was created. So um, like I said, for those five phases, the inception, design, development, deployment, and stabilization, there's gonna be an assignment that goes with each one of those. And as we go through it, uh, each phase, and we talk about it and we kind of understand how they work, then we're gonna have an assignment that goes with it. So this first week, we're gonna talk about inception. Um, coming up with that idea, how do you do it? We want to make an app, we want to make something that's really interesting, and we want to make something that is going to be different. So a competitive advantage, what do I mean by competitive advantage? Or unfair advantage, as you may have heard uh, somewhere else. So basically, if you are wanting to make an app that's going to be for dog walkers, and it's going to put out an alert that you're ready to walk dogs between this time and this time on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and people can sign up to have their dog walked, right? You know, are there other apps that already exist that do that? If so, how are they different? And why or how would yours be better? So if I came up with, <clears throat> and I've had students in the past do this, they came up with an idea for an app that was a ride sharing program or a ride sharing app. So you go on, you say you wanna go somewhere and then you get connected with a driver and they have a car and you don't and you have a location and then they get notified of that and they take you to that location for a, for a fee. What does that sound like? Uber, right? So Uber already exists. It's dominating the market for personal taxis or private taxis. So how would you compete with Uber? Right, so what some students did in the past was um, instead of Uber, they made it about ride sharing. So they made it about carpooling and it wasn't necessarily um, someone who was just doing Uber to be a taxi driver, but say maybe you were on your, excuse me, on your way to work and you put your route in that that's your way to work. And then other people put their route in and that's also their way to work. And then you figure out like, oh, we can carpool and I can go these days of the week and you can go these days of the week and then we can save on gas half the time. Right, So coming up with those little twists or those little unique traits that make your app different or um, yeah, different um, are really key. So we call that a competitive advantage so, it's you, so you can compete. Um, for apps that will be distributed in an enterprise, you gotta think about infrastructure integration. So that probably won't be any of us. We're probably all making individual apps, but basically if you were going to be making an app, say for Georgian College, what existing infrastructures will it integrate with or extend? So is it gonna work with Blackboard? Is it gonna work with Banner? Is it gonna work with their website? Is it gonna work with uh, the registrar, right? What systems already exist and how are you gonna to connect to them? And then you have to do all the research on that. So if you wanna do that, go for it. Um, I don't wanna shut that down, but it is gonna be a lot of work to make sure that it's already working with an existing system. <clears throat> Um, apps should be evaluated in the context of the mobile form factors. So if you think about like a video game or something that you want to make, um, make sure that it would make sense to have that video game on the, on a phone. 
uh, you know, like if it's a first person shooter or something that might be really hard to get through to someone on a phone because you have such a small screen, you don't have a lot of real estate for buttons and moving around might be really difficult, right? Well, that's more well suited to say something like Xbox, PlayStation or the PC. Um, value, what value does your app bring to users? So if it's that dog walking program, you know, it brings value because they don't have to walk their dog. They don't have to be at work. You can just go pick their dog up and their dog gets a walk and right. So how will they use it? Um, right. Same kind of thing. And then form mobility. How will this app work in a mobile form factor? How can I add value using mobile technologies such as location awareness or the camera? So like, why would I create this for a mobile app as opposed to just a website? Why wouldn't I just make a website for dog walking? Right. And what would make it better? Maybe uh, on their phone, they can get notifications and pictures sent to them when your dog's been picked up and when their dog's at the park and you can, you can, uh, you know, throughout the day, get a notification like, oh, your dog uh, has done this, whatever, to click to see this picture. And maybe that makes sense because people are on their phones all the time and they see notification. Whereas if it was a website, uh, it would be a little bit more clunky. So then it makes sense to develop that for the app, uh, for the mobile platform. Cool. So these questions, I just want you guys to keep in your head and answer. Uh, they're kind of gonna tie into the assignment one in a loose way. And I want you to start brainstorming in the first two weeks here, we're going to try to come up with an app idea. All right. So come up with a couple and flush them out and see what you like, see what sticks. And, uh, we'll work with that as we go through the semester. The next thing I want to talk about is use cases. So I'm curious if anyone's used a use case before, if you have, you can email me, you can say you've used use cases. If you haven't, don't worry, we're going to talk about it. We're going to introduce it. Basically, it's a form of UML or universal modeling language, and it's going to help with designing the functionality of an app. So it can be useful to define the actors in your system. And the actors are basically roles within your application, um, and oftentimes they're users. So this is a course organizer uh, program, so something like Blackboard, right, where you have a lecturer, you have a student, and you have an admin of Blackboard. Okay, so the users are gonna be the lecturer, they're gonna be the student, and they're gonna be the admin. And those little stick people you see on the side in, in uh, use cases or UML, we call those actors. Okay, so oftentimes they're users. Sometimes it can be uh, you know something else other than a user, but most times it's a user. Um, in software and system engineering, a use case is basically a list of actions or event steps that typically define the interactions between uh, a role as an actor and the system to achieve a specific goal. So, uh, you know, when you go to blackboard.gcblackboard.com, whatever, right, for Georgian, you have to put your username in and your password and then click log in. And that's an action that you do with the system. And it verifies your password, it verifies your username, and then you can successfully log in. You can also log out. So we can see those first two examples there. Uh, kind of work with this example of a Blackboard system, right? Um, so once you've reached sort of an appropriate number of use cases, so each little bubble there is called a use case. It's basically a scenario, right? Uh, or an action that the user or the actor can take with the system. Once you've reached an appropriate number of those use cases um, and actors has been you know, captured on this entire system, then it's much easier to start designing your application. So then you can focus on development, then you can focus on design and how to create the app rather than what the app is or what it should do because you already have that all written down. So you've, you know, you've covered every possibility. So like I can log into the system, I can log out of the system, I can register as a new user, I can pick a course, I can create a course, I can drop a course, I can submit assignments, I can look up material, I can download material. Right, and you make all of the ones that make sense for you, and then you connect it to the users that they belong to. And then when you step back and you look at this whole thing, this whole uh, use case diagram, then you can kind of see like all of the different methods that you would have to put into designing a mobile application. Awesome. So here's another example of a use case. Um, this is a little bit more complex, but if we take a look at it here, 
we have a food ordering system, right? Or we have a restaurant. And on the right-hand side, you can kind of see, um, I gave a rough legend of what the shapes mean. So this is, um, this is a restaurant. We have a waiter, we have a client, we have a cashier, and we have a chef. And those are our users. Inside of these bubbles, these are our activities, all right, or our use cases, okay? Now we can see uh, the extend. Don't worry about those yet. We'll talk about those a little bit later, but basically it just means one can't exist without the other. It only comes after another step, okay? So um, this square box here that you can see, it's in a lighter gray is the system boundary. So everything inside of that is what happens inside the restaurant. And everything on the outside of that is basically an actor. So if you were a client and you came into the restaurant, you can, okay, so you walk in, you sit at your table, whatever. You can order food, you can eat the food, and then you can pay for the food, right? So those are the three methods that they have connected to the client here. As a waiter, Okay, you have way different options. You can uh, receive that order that the client takes. You can serve the food once you bring that order to the chef and the chef cooks it. And then once they pay for the food, you can receive or facilitate the payment and receive a tip, right? Um, now, as the chef, you have a different job as well. You are cooking the food, right? So you receive those orders from the customers and then you cook the food and then you give the food back so that the waiter can deliver it to the table as well as the cashier if you have a cashier usually the waiters also do the the cashier but if you have a cashier then they accept the payment right um yeah just another example um so basically uh we talked about an activity here an activity in uml or unified modeling language is a major task that must take place in order to fulfill an operation uh, contract. A state, which is this square with rounded corners, is a current condition or an event of an activity. And basically, it's used to describe state changes triggered by events. So I'll show you in some other examples. Um, the control flow. So control flow here, we can see this. That's the order in which things happen. And then you have uh, object flow, which is a little bit different. Object flow is a path along which objects or data can pass. So these are used more in something called activity diagrams. That's a little bit different uh, than a use case diagram. So I'll show you an activity diagram right now. This legend is a little bit more useful when it comes to activity diagrams. So not to get too confusing on you, but this is another form of UML called an activity diagram. So we had use cases, which was basically the actors on the sides. And then we have activity diagrams, which is basically something you can create once you've created your use case diagram. And it always has a start and an end, which is this black dot or this 
dot with a circle around it for the end. You can have parallel activities, so they split off of this node, and then they rejoin at this node here. So this happens at the same time as this. So we can look at, this is uh, for delivery. Um, so basically, if you receive an order, you can fill that order at the same time as sending the invoice to the client. Okay, and then the diamond indicates a decision. So either uh, you have to rush the order or it's just a normal order. So either they've ordered, uh, you know, one day prime Amazon delivery, and that's gonna be this pathway. It's kind of like one of those decision charts uh, or else basically it's just gonna be a normal delivery. So regular delivery or overnight delivery. And then it comes back and meets at that decision pathway and continues and joins in at the node and it ends. At the same time as all of this, you're sending the invoice and you're receiving a payment from the client. This is a really basic example, but we can create these activity diagrams that represent the activity of our application in the order of events that should occur. So basically you have your use case, which is all of the events that could occur at any time by any user. And then we take them and we kind of put them in the correct order using the activity diagram. And then we put the arrows in the right way. So that's what this PowerPoint was basically showing. Um, I lost my slide here, but right here, that's what that UML is for. This is a use case. So slightly confusing, I can see, but um, that is hopefully cleared up. Cool. So uh, a real life example, cool. So we're gonna show you a little bit about uh, what I created when I was overseas, and you're gonna get a chance to have a sneak peek at that. All right, so here is my dissertation that I made. The app I chose to create was an Android training application for paramedicine. So for paramedics who are out in the field and they wanted to get better trained with medicine or applying certain CPR techniques, I created basically a quiz and testing application where they could compete in high scores. And it was a gamified version of educating them so they could get better at their job. Uh, so basically this is gonna be a this is a really intense example of everything you can see here of what we're going to build in this course. All right, so we have our introduction where we talk about what the app is and the idea of it. And then there's a user manual. And along the way in the documentation, you, you kind of keep track of, you know, screenshots of different screens and how they're supposed to be used. Here's the login screen and, and the login dialog and how it works. And then there's the main menu and everything. So, um, you know, the different type of uh, categories that they can choose to be trained in and if they would like to do training or testing. So as we go through this, the part that I want to focus on, you know, they can see if they did the correct answer or the incorrect answer. Saving it to a database. Um, let's see, there was an admin panel that was created where you could create new tests online through React. And then through an API, it was saved into a online database and those questions were put into the test. Um, so you could log in as an admin or you could log in as a user. You also had to do the ERD diagram, which is the entity relationship diagram. Uh, so basically, you know, mapping out the entire database, wrong questions and correct question results, answers, question types, and, you know, hooking them up with primary keys um, here is a bit about what I want to show you. So basically, um, a real life example of what we use UML for. So when I first started, this isn't necessarily written in the order of what I did everything in, but this, uh, documentation, like these ones specifically were done before I actually developed the app. So I came up with an activity diagram that helped me, uh, process the, the workflow of one activity to another within the system. So basically we had our start node. I processed the selected category for the test, and then I loaded the corresponding questions. I displayed them and I accepted the user input. If it was correct, then I would display positive feedback saying, way to go, that was correct. If it was incorrect, then I would just correct the answer and I'd give them feedback. Then I would accept that user input and go next question and then repeat, and then basically finish, right? And there's a bunch of these testing activity diagrams for different uh, scenarios. So one was for quizzes, one was for tests, one was for uh, reviewing your, your, um, your grade. Um, 
here's a, another UML diagram of the web service and the API that was working, um, as well as swim lanes uh, or sequence diagrams, sorry, for the, uh, the web service. So you can see how basically using those UML and using those diagrams really do help you uh, in terms of uh, planning your application and actually creating it. So I wonder if there's any other good stuff in here. Yes. So at the very end, uh, this was some of my first documentation that I did before I actually created the final version of it. And I would encourage you guys, I will accept anything that you guys do. Um, it's really cool actually to look back at your application when you've made a fully Say you make Uber, right? And you look back and you see the very first things that you wrote on a napkin when you had an idea. That's kind of like what this is, right? Like I sat down one day with my mentor and we came up with this idea and I started writing things down. I was getting all these ideas and I was like, oh, cool. Well, what if this is an, act an activity? And what if they do this? And what if there's a different choice, blah, blah, blah. And, and here's the actor, right? And you start drawing stuff out and you get different ideas and you can you know, like log in, test results draw them all out and then you can make professional versions of it later. Document everything. Basically this course is going to be a portfolio with all this documentation on this app that we're going to make to brag about ourselves. Um, and the more documentation you have, the better it looks because you can basically be like, man, look where I started from, look where I, where I am now. Um, so here's another one with the swim, uh, with the activity flow and diagram and other documentation there, sketch activities um, and entity relationship diagrams with the database, uh, as well as uh, the system connections and endpoints. So that's more for the API with the JSON, everything. Um, and more endpoints there with get, post, put, and delete. Uh, you guys will learn more about that with, uh, with the API course in the second semester. Cool, um, and then this was just more stuff for database and data models. Uh, but yeah, basically, this whole thing is like a 32-page document of everything I did from start to finish with my app and uh, just a real-life example of kind of a large-scale version of what we're going to try to create here in four months, okay? So um, yeah, if you have any questions, then let me know. I can, I'd can i be happy to answer them, but I uh, just wanted to show you guys that uh, as an example. Cool. So we're going to get into a little bit of a demo now building a use case. Uh, you can use any of these versions or these websites below. I'm going to open them all and I'm going to show you and it's totally up to you which one you use. Um, so we're going to make a use case um, for an ATM. All right. So I'm going to open these up right now. I'll pause the video. When I have them open, I'll show you guys the different websites and you can choose to follow along on whichever one you like.
Okay, welcome back guys. So um, this is the first website. I couldn't get all of them working, uh, but I have two for you. So two options to choose from. You can also Google around and find your own. There's a ton of these free versions uh, online. You just have to give your email and then sign in. So the first one is app.genmymodel.com. You can see the address up here in the top left. So uh, you can just type that in. I've created an account here and I've got my own personal workspace. You create this uh, new project button here, and then you have all these options for different types of flowcharts you can create, different types of journey maps, projects, system, uh, MLs, uh, like modeling language, but we wanna use UML, which is what we've been talking about this whole time, okay? So we can do a blank project import or public repository. We're gonna do a blank project, and then we're just gonna call this ATM. We're gonna make a, a basic uh, version of ATM. You can choose to make it public or private, uh, you can give it a description uh, down here, and then you can also choose. So these are the different types of diagrams. We talked about an activity diagram earlier, right? That's the one with all the arrows with the start node and the end node, and they can split and fork and join uh, when there's different decisions that need to be made. And we've talked about a use case diagram, all right? I did mention sequence diagram really quickly there, but we're not gonna worry about that one for today, just these two. Uh, so we're gonna start with a use case diagram. So you wanna select that there. And then if we wanted to give a brief description, uh, this is a basic UML uh, diagram of an ATM system. All right, and then we create it. So once you hit create, project name must be at least four, four characters long, ATM system. All right, great, cool. And so once that's created, it's gonna open up your project into your project space here. And then you can click open in editor or live view. Um, and this is just kind of giving you information. You can, uh, if you want to collaborate with it on someone, you can create an organization here. If you wanted to have different versions, you can create versioning control. So like GitHub, you could have, you know, your very first version throughout the project, which is really cool. And as your project fleshes out and you change some stuff, you could have version two, version 2.1, et cetera. And then all the settings for your stuff, uh, for your project here, if you want to change the description or the name, or even the visibility to public, you can do that here. You can delete the project there as well. So basically in the summary, I'm gonna click open in editor, and then it's gonna open a new tab and it's gonna be the editing screen. So this is gonna be where you can add those use case uh, bubbles and the actors and the arrows and uh, in that system. So I'm just gonna pause the video until this loads up, all right? All right, so here we are, awesome. And I would really encourage you guys to follow along because this is lab one, which is gonna be worth marks. And I want you guys to upload uh, an example of a use case that you come up with on your own, not for an ATM machine, but for something else. And I want you guys to upload that to the lab one, take a screenshot of your use case, and then also give a brief description of a couple ideas of what you're hoping to do for the company uh, that you're wanting to build or the the brand and the portfolio and, and uh, the app idea. So. You'll see that when you click the lab one in weekly learning, but um, basically for right now, you can follow along, create the ATM, and then you'll know how to do uh, the lab one <clears throat> by using this uh, GenMy model. Cool. Um, so now that we're here, uh, we can create the, uh, the UML diagram. I just wanted to show you quickly another option, which was uh, if you type in draw.io into your browser and click enter, it's gonna redirect you, but app.diagrams.net. And basically it's gonna redirect you. It redirected me to um, something that already had stuff on it. Yours might be empty, but basically you don't have to create an account on this one. You can just start um, editing stuff right away. I'm just clicking these and deleting them. So I have a blank project. You could also just do file new. Um, but this isn't as snazzy to me because you don't necessarily pick that you're doing UML or, or not. You just go on the side here and you drag over an actor. Um, you know, you try to pick your arrows uh, and then you connect it to your actor like that. And then, uh, you know, if we want to create our system, we can put it on here and then we have to bring our actor back on top of it. But um, so you can do this if you want to. I prefer to use 
uh, the gen my model. So I'm going to just close these, but that is an option just in case you guys wanted to use that. So I'm going to close these for now and we're going to come, come back to app.genmymodel.com. So on the left here is our project panel where we can see we're in the ATM system project and then we can have different diagrams and we're creating a use case diagram right now. Now under here, I just ignore all of this because uh, that's for importing some other stuff, but we're not going to do that. Um, and then here's all the properties that we can change um, down here, but we're also not going to worry about these either. What we want to look at is right here. Okay, so we can move this whole thing over because we're not going to really be using it too much. <clears throat> we only have one project on the go and uh, we're already inside of it, so we don't have to change any of this stuff. On the left hand side here, you can see I just expanded some of these drop downs and you can see uh, one of them is called use case diagram. Inside of that, when I expand it, it's going to be all of the drawing tools that we need to create a use case. So basically the package is going to be um, our system. So I can double click in here and we're doing this for an ATM. So everything inside of this box is going to be our use cases and anything on the outside will be our actors. So as a, yeah, as an actor or what would be an actor in a ATM. So you go up to an ATM to withdraw money. So you are the actor, a customer, the user, right? So we'll drag an actor over. We'll just double click this name and we will click customer because, um, you know, I bank with, uh, you know, RBC or Tangerine or, you know, Scotiabank, right? Um, so I'm a customer of those banks because you pay to keep your money there. So customer, all right, who else um, is an actor in the system? Who owns the ATM? The banks do, right? So Scotiabank owns the Scotiabank ATM. So we'll bring that over here. I like to keep them a little bit separate. One will be on one side, one will be on the other side because you know the customer is on this side, there's the system in the middle. You interact with that system, the ATM, and then the bank owns the ATM, right? So it's kind of like this. Um, and then there is one other one that I want you to try to think of. It's a bit obscure, but who else could be involved with an ATM besides the bank and the customer? You know, if you're going out to take money from an ATM, and you go up and you know the banks put the ATM there so the bank's already been involved and you punch your SIN card in and uh, your SIN number or whatever, or your PIN, sorry, not your SIN, you put your PIN number in and there's no bills in there. It's empty. And it says on the screen, call this number to you know get a technician to service this machine. Okay, so then you call that number and then this van pulls up and a guy comes out and he starts working on the machine and he loads it up with bills there you go. That's another actor in the system, a technician, right? Someone who can fix the ATM. So uh, we'll just put that down here, technician. So we don't have to include this one. I just like to kind of make you think, you know, oh, there could be other actors in the system besides the user and the owner, right? So technician. All right. So as a customer, what do I do when I, when I first walk up to an ATM? What is the first thing I do? You want to log in or something, right? You want to put your bank card, you, you, you put it in the, the little thing that eats your bank card, right? You slide it into the debit reader and then it asks you to enter your PIN. So this is going to be where we use a use case. So this is going to be our first kind of uh, action within the system. And I'm going to call it for, for the sake of easiness, we're going to call it logging in because you're logging in with your PIN. All right. Now, either one of two things can happen. I can type my PIN in correctly, and I'm in the system, or I can type my PIN in incorrectly. So uh, that is gonna be kind of extending off of this. So if we have a bad PIN, all right. Now, don't worry about this yet. I'm gonna explain it in a little bit if you're still a little bit confused, but basically this, can only happen after this. So you can't get a bad pin message or error message unless you've tried logging in. Okay, so that's if you entered a bad pin. Um, now, notice I have an arrow going to that because it's extending off that. It belongs to this 
action, the login action. We also need to connect a line to the customer, uh, to the action that the customer is involved with. We can do that after though, once we've made, oops, I'm just gonna delete that. Once we've created all of these actions, uh, we can connect them to the ones they belong to and you can see kind of how that works. So um, let's say we log in and it's successful, all right? Um, we don't have to create an action for that, we can, but we can also just assume that if you, you know, withdraw or deposit that you logged in successfully. So um, what would be some actions that we can do once we're logged in? Well, like I just said, we can deposit money deposit funds. And what's the opposite of that? You can deposit funds when you go and you can withdraw funds. Awesome. Now, um, this deposit funds and withdraw funds, they can only happen after you've logged in. But we're going to use the include. And I'll explain this in a bit. So don't worry about it too much, but it's going to be included in the login function. And because withdraw is under deposit, we can just use this association. Cool. Now, uh, when you deposit your funds or withdraw your funds at the same time, you also want to check your balance. So that can be our last check balance. That can be our last one. And I don't think these need to be connected. Oops, delete, check balance. Okay. I'm trying to think here. Yeah, good. Now, uh, let's say, what's one that the technician can do? The technician can perform maintenance. Or uh, let's say they can they can fill the tray with, with funds. They can also repair the machine if it's broken. Okay, so those are two for the technician. And then what can the bank do? What, what does the bank do in this scenario? The bank can also withdraw funds for you. It can also deposit funds for you. It can also withdraw funds or sorry, check your balance. So let's start doing some of the associations. So the customer, we know the customer already can log in. We know the customer can deposit funds once they've logged in. Um, we know they can uh, withdraw and check their balance, but only once they're logged in. So what we're gonna do is this, okay? So we're not gonna connect them straight to the customer because they have to go through the login function first. The technician, he can fill the tray with funds. He can also repair. Now, can the bank also do that? I mean, the bank might be able to do that. The bank can check your balance for you. The bank can withdraw funds for you. The bank can deposit funds for you if you go to a branch or something. Um, yeah, so, so you kind of end up with something like this. It's a very basic version, very basic example. Um, of a UML diagram. And then what you can do, uh, you know, once we've got this, we can download it or save it. Uh, we can export it as an image. We can export it as an XMI or as a document. And once you export it as an image, basically you can open it in your browser or download it as a PNG or a JPEG, something like that, and then upload it to Blackboard. Cool, so I wanna explain to you guys a little bit the includes and the extends. So. The includes use case, here's an example of a use case that's in includes. So basically, include, this is an example of it. You have a user who can ride a car, who can ride a bike, and who can ride a tractor. They all have something in common, which is starting the engine. Starting an engine is required by a car and a tractor. Sorry, they don't all have that in common. The riding the bike doesn't. So if a user wants to ride a car, they must also start the engine. If the user wants to ride a tractor, they must also start the engine. So basically, if you want to do this, you have to include this other action. So if I want to do, a, oh, I just lost my headphone. If you want to do a withdrawal, you basically have to log in first, is how that works. If you want to do a deposit, you have to log in first. If you want to ride a car, you have to start the engine. 
So that's what the includes is. And then the extends, if we just upload this one up here, here's an example of an extends. So basically this is gonna be for like an Instagram, if you wanna upload a photo or a video. Um, it's not something that you have to necessarily do. You don't have to, up, when you upload the photo and upload the video, you don't necessarily need to apply a filter. It can run without that, but it extends off of it. So just like uh, you know, a bad pin error message, you don't necessarily get every time you log in, you might get it if you do type in the bad pin. So that's kind of you know those two examples, going back to the ATM with the extends and the includes. Cool, all right. Um, let me think what else I wanted to cover here in the PowerPoint. We did our ATM. Awesome, so I might split the video up into a fourth video here now, uh, explaining the lab for today and some of the weekly work, and then I'm gonna talk about the assignment and brainstorming our, our app, okay? So I'm gonna stop this video here. You'll see video four uploaded, um, and you know you can follow that along for the assignment and for the lab work. Cool, thanks guys.